A Reminiscence of Dr. Samuel Johnson by H.P. Lovecraft. Recording by Cameron Halkett. The privilege of reminiscence, however rambling or tiresome, is one generally allowed to the very aged. Indeed, tis frequently by means of such recollections that the obscure occurrences of history and the lesser anecdotes of the great are transmitted to posterity. Though many of my readers have at times observed and remarked a sort of antique flow in my style of writing, it hath pleased me to pass amongst the members of this generation as a young man, giving out the fiction that I was born in 1890 in America. I am now, however, resolved to unburden myself of a secret which I have hitherto kept through dread of incredulity, and to impart to the public a true knowledge of my long years in order to gratify their taste for authentic information of an age with whose famous personages I was on familiar terms. Be it then known that I was born on the family estate in Devonshire of the 10th day of August, 1690, or in the new Gregorian style of reckoning the 20th of August, being therefore now in my 228th year. Coming early to London, I saw as a child many of the celebrated men of King William's reign, including the lamented Mr. Dryden, who sat much at the tables of Will's Coffee House. With Mr. Addison and Dr. Swift, I later became very well acquainted, and was an even more familiar friend to Mr. Pope, whom I knew and respected till the day of his death. But since it is of my more recent associate, the late Dr. Johnson, that I am at this time desired to write, I will pass over my youth for the present. I had first knowledge of the doctor in May of the year 1738, though I did not at that time meet him. Mr. Pope had just completed his epilogue to his satires, the piece beginning not twice a twelve-month you appear in print, and had arranged for its publication. On the very day it appeared, there was also published a satire in Imitation of Juvenal, entitled London by the then unknown Johnson, and this so struck the town that many gentlemen of taste declared it was the work of a greater poet than Mr. Pope. Notwithstanding what some detractors have said of Mr. Pope's petty jealousy, he gave the verses of his new rival no small praise, and having learnt through Mr. Richardson who the poet was, told me that Mr. Johnson would soon be deterred. I had no personal acquaintance with the doctor till 1763, when I was presented to him at the Mitre Tavern by Mr. James Boswell, a young Scotchman of excellent family and great learning, but small wit, whose metrical effusions I had sometimes revised. Dr. Johnson, as I beheld him, was a full, pursy man, very ill-dressed and of slovenly aspect. I recall him to have worn a bushy bob wig, untied and without powder, and much too small for his head. His clothes were of rusty brown, much wrinkled, and with more than one button missing. His face, too full to be handsome, was likewise marred by the effects of some scrofulous disorder, and his head was continually rolling about in a sort of convulsive way. Of this infirmity, indeed, I had known before, having heard of it from Mr. Pope, who took the trouble to make particular inquiries. Being nearly seventy-three, full nineteen years older than Dr. Johnson, I say doctor, though his degree came not till two years afterward, I naturally expected him to have some regard for my age, and was therefore not in that fear of him which others confessed. On my asking him what he thought of my favorable notice of his dictionary in the Londoner, my periodical paper, he said, Sir, I possess no recollection of having perused your paper, and have not a great interest in the opinions of the less thoughtful part of mankind. Being more than a little piqued at the incivility of one whose celebrity made me solicitous of his approbation, I ventured to retaliate in kind, and told him I was surprised that a man of sense should judge the thoughtfulness of one whose productions he admitted never having read. Why, sir, replied Johnson, I do not require to become familiar with a man's writings in order to estimate the superficiality of his attainments, when he plainly skews it by his eagerness to mention his own productions in the first question he puts to me. Having thus become friends, we conversed on many matters. When to agree with him, I said I was distrustful of the authenticity of Ocean's poems, Mr. Johnson said, That, sir, does not do your understanding particular credit. For what all the town is sensible of is no great discovery for a Grub Street critic to make. You might as well say you have a strong suspicion that Milton wrote Paradise Lost. I thereafter saw Johnson very frequently, most often at meetings of the Literary Club, which was founded the next year by the doctor, together with Mr. Burke, the parliamentary orator, Mr. Beauclerk, a gentleman of fashion, Mr. Langton, a pious man and captain of militia, 
Sir J. Reynolds, the widely known painter, Dr. Goldsmith, the prose and poetic writer, Dr. Nugent, father-in-law to Mr. Burke, Sir John Hawkins, Mr. Anthony Charmier, and myself. We assembled generally at seven o'clock of an evening, once a week at the Turk's Head in Gerard Street, Soho, till that tavern was sold and made into a private dwelling, after which event we moved our gathering successively to Prince's in Sackville Street, Letelier's in Dover Street, and Parslow's and the Thatched House in St. James's Street. In these meetings we preserved a remarkable degree of amity and tranquility, which contrasts very favorably with some of the dissensions and disruptions I observe in the literary and amateur press associations of today. This tranquility was the more remarkable because we had amongst us gentlemen of very opposed opinions. Dr. Johnson and I, as well as many others, were high Tories, whilst Mr. Burke was a Whig and against the American War, many of his speeches on that subject having been widely published. The least congenial member was one of the founders, Sir John Hawkins, who hath since written many misrepresentations of our society. Sir John, an eccentric fellow, once declined to pay his part of the reckoning for supper because twas his custom at home to eat no supper. Later, he insulted Mr. Burke in so intolerable a manner that we all took pains to show our disapproval, after which incident he came no more to our meetings. However, he never openly fell out with the doctor and was the executor of his will, though Mr. Boswell and others have reason to question the genuineness of his attachment. Other and later members of the club were Mr. David Garrick, the actor and early friend of Dr. Johnson, Messrs. Thomas and Joseph Wharton, Dr. Adam Smith, Dr. Percy, author of The Reliquist, Mr. Edward Gibbon, the historian, Dr. Burney, the musician, Mr. Malone, the critic, and Mr. Boswell. Mr. Garrick obtained admittance only with difficulty, for the doctor, notwithstanding his great friendship, was forever affecting to decry the stage and all things connected with it. Johnson, indeed, had a most singular habit of speaking for Davy when others were against him, and of arguing against him when others were for him. I have no doubt that he sincerely loved Mr. Garrick, for he never alluded to him as he did to Foote, who was a very coarse fellow despite his comic genius. Mr. Gibbon was none too well liked, for he had an odious, sneering way which offended even those of us who most admired his historical productions. Mr. Goldsmith, a little man, very vain of his dress and very deficient in brilliancy of conversation, was my particular favorite, since I was equally unable to shine in the discourse. He was vastly jealous of Dr. Johnson, though nonetheless liking and respecting him. I remember that once a foreigner, a German, I think, was in our company, and that whilst Goldsmith was speaking, he observed the doctor preparing to utter something. Unconsciously looking upon Goldsmith as a mere encumbrance when compared to the greater man, the foreigner bluntly interrupted him and incurred his lasting hostility by crying, Hush! Dr. Johnson is going to speak! In this luminous company I was tolerated more because of my years than for my wit or learning, being no match at all for the rest. My friendship for the celebrated Monsieur Voltaire was ever a cause of annoyance to the doctor, who was deeply orthodox and who used to say of the French philosopher, Vir est acarimi ingenii et pocaram literarum. Mr. Boswell, a little teasing fellow whom I'd known for some time previously, used to make sport of my awkward manners and old-fashioned wig and clothes. Once coming in a little the worse for wine, to which he was addicted, he endeavored to lampoon me by means of an impromptu in verse writ on the surface of the table, but lacking the aid he usually had in his composition, he made a bad grammatical blunder. I told him he should not try to pasquinade the source of his poesy. At another time, Bozzy, as we used to call him, complained of my harshness toward new writers in the articles I prepared for the monthly review. He said I pushed every aspirant off the slopes of Parnassus. Sir, I replied, you are mistaken. They who lose their hold do so from their own want of strength, but desiring to conceal their weakness, they attribute the absence of success to the first critic that mentions them. I am glad to recall that Dr. Johnson upheld me in this matter. Dr. Johnson was second to no man in the pains he took to revise the bad verses of others. Indeed, tis said that in the book of poor blind old Mrs. Williams there are scarce two lines which are not the doctor's. At one time, Johnson recited to me some lines by a servant to the Duke of Leeds, which had so amused him that he had got them by heart. They are on the Duke's wedding, and so much resemble in quality the work of other and more recent poetic dunces that I cannot forbear copying them. When the Duke of Leeds shall married be to a fine young lady of high quality, how happy will that gentlewoman be in his grace of Leeds good company? I asked the doctor if he had ever tried making sense of this piece, and upon his saying he had not, 
I amused myself with the following amendment of it. When gallant leads auspiciously shall wed, the virtuous fair of ancient lineage bred, how must the maid rejoice with conscious pride to win so great an husband to her side? On showing this to Dr. Johnson, he said, Sir, you have straightened out the feet, but you have put neither wit nor poetry into the lines. It would afford me gratification to tell more of my experiences with Dr. Johnson and his circle of wits, but I am an old man and easily fatigued. I seem to ramble along without much logic or continuity when I endeavor to recall the past, and I fear I light upon but few incidents which others have not before discussed. Should my present recollections meet with favor, I might later set down some further anecdotes of old times of which I am the only survivor. I recall many things of Sam Johnson and his club, having kept up my membership in the latter long after the doctor's death, at which I sincerely mourned. I remember how John Burgoyne, Esquire, the general, whose dramatic and poetical works were printed after his death, was blackballed by three votes, probably because of his unfortunate defeat in the American War at Saratoga. Poor John. His son fared better, I think, and was made a baronet. But I am very tired. I am old, very old, and it's time for my afternoon nap.